there seems to be a problem when people want to learn that they get stuck in the tutorial hell or endless cycle of one tutorial after the other. And I was wondering, because it never felt like a trap for me, I use tutorials, for me they are really useful. So then I was like, why is it that what's so special about my approach that I can gain a lot more from tutorials than it seems other people? The other thing is that somebody asked me in one of the comments if I can show how I take my notes. And first I thought, this is probably very... I'm not really sure if this is so useful because I'm just taking notes, not nothing special. And then recently when I was learning something and I was like, okay, it's not so special, so I don't need to do it this time. So for a couple of days I didn't do it my normal way and really drove me mad because I couldn't fully organize the material the way I was used to. So I have decided to um, walk you through how I learn. Also, I will talk a little bit of the difference between beginner and more advanced. And since notes are so essential for me, I will also show you quite a few of my notes. So I have like this much of four of the small ones, which is like 40 um, pages. So this is one, this is for example, one of the uh, pages in one of these books. I will show you more in detail about this, my notes, and you can find the link in the description so you can scroll through my notes. Some of them are pretty, some of them are less so. Unfortunately, the quality is not the best because I use pencils, because then I can erase it. This is not school where you're trapped in always being repeated of your own mistakes. You can just erase it and do it again. So in this video, I will show you how I approach new things and problems and mistakes. And the ultimate goal when I want to learn to code is that I want to build projects and I want to, when I build them, at the same time understand, really understand it, see the bigger picture. And this helps me because only if I really understand it to create something new, to be able to creatively solve a problem, to critically think about it because I have an idea of what's going on. So I don't want to read and learn as much as possible. I want to learn high quality so I can make the most of my knowledge. And one of my friends, he's a material science engineer doing his studies. And one of his exams, actually, this is, I think this is probably the most important thing he ever learned in his whole studies. So he's, he was quite lazy. So he was just not doing a lot and learning the day before as most people who procrastinate. So this is their oral exam. And in the end of the exam, the professor told him, that he is probably one of the students who knows the least, but by far makes the most of his knowledge. Because every time he got a question to solve, he was like, okay, what do I know that could help me? It's probably not what the professor told them, a specific detail, but what he already know to figure out how to at least say something. So the fact that the professor highlighted that you make the most of your knowledge really stuck with him. But this is what you also want to do with software engineering, with coding, because you have a limited amount of tools, codes, views, styling options, behaviors, how to pass data. You have a limited amount of tools that you need to use in a sometimes really smart way to make the app that you want. That's why actually coding is very a creative process. It's not like people would more associate creativity with artists, but probably you need even more creativity if you work in such an advanced thinking space like coding, mathematics, physics, because you have, you cannot just use another color, not a pencil. You need to really come up with smart solutions. One of the things that people say that gets them out of their tutorial hell is to start building their own project. And at some point I was like, maybe this is not, if you start too early, it's very frustrating and you get stuck a lot. When I started learning after three months um, with the Stanford courses, I started building my own project and I got so frustrated and I was like, oh, why can I not after three months be able to do this? And this is obviously my wrong assumption that the problem wasn't that I'm not good enough. The problem was that I had this really stupid assumption that this is enough time to learn it properly. But the good thing is if you start building your project, because this can take so much time, it's a huge motivation because you 
have a goal to work towards, you have a bigger picture in mind. And you also, because you have so much you could learn, you can see it, you can pick more specifically the road ahead. You don't need to learn everything at once, just get good at one direction. So in the end, I would say if you want to in the between build further on your projects, do it because every time you have another iteration of realizations of what you need to know, what you actually want to know, what's there to know. The other thing is by building your own pet projects, because they are fun, you only do it for yourself. They are motivating and they help you to build a toolbox that you actually want to acquire. So it's not only knowledge, it's it can be knowledge, theoretical knowledge, but more importantly, you want to get these skills, the feeling the same way you need to train in order to be really good at tennis or playing a music instruments. You need to play a lot and train a lot. This is building your own projects. It's the training that you need in order to reach the master level. So now let's have a look at what I actually do to reach master level. I start, especially if, I'm, if I have no clue about the topic, I start with an easy to follow tutorial, maybe even a video because it's just easier. I also look for different tutorials, so maybe two or three or the written ones, because then I see different implementation of the same thing, maybe different use cases, different kinds of customizations, different kinds of explanations. So if one explanation doesn't fit me or I don't just don't get it from one explanation, maybe another person has a better a way of explaining it that fits better with my knowledge, with my mind. When I look at these tutorials, I do write the project on the same time, but I most of the time stop, then compare, have a look what's doing it, break it. It's always good to break things. If you don't know what it's doing, it just break it so you know what you're actually breaking it. If you just start, you cannot very easily go away from the implementation they show you. If you have a better understanding, you can really draw from all the other topics you already know about. If you just start, you can also do small steps like changing maybe a color somewhere, a font, the size, just little things if you start. You can look for how can I change and customize the look and behavior. And you also really important you should look for use cases because this is in the end when you want to create smart solutions. A creative solution is when you use something in a very unusual way that nobody ever thought of for this tool. Then at this point, when I have my 5,000 implementations of the same thing, and I have a lot of sample projects where I just do the same thing all over again in different variations. The problem at this point, I have so much stuff in my head that it feels a little bit like it overwhelms me. It feels like I have some confusion, unordered puzzles in my mind. It's like bees because my, I'm trying to put this together like a puzzle. You have, after you collected all the steps, the pieces for your puzzle, but you still didn't put it together yet. So in order to put it together and also to put it together with the stuff I have in my mind, that's when I start to write it down. So I write maybe the whole implementation. Maybe I have already a look. So here, this is some parts of Swift UI and UI views. So on the left side, I did try to have a blueprint. So this is the theoretical, what parts do I need? I need to have this protocol. This is the functions that I can use. This is actually, some of them are required. So this is really the bare bones of what I would need to do with no specifics. Then here's some kind of, what kind of transformations, what, of, what kind of extra properties can I use? This is all the theoretical stuff that I need. And on the right side, I have one concrete example because the more examples you see, the more patterns. This is how our pattern recognition, recognition works. You need to see a couple of examples in order to really, I mean, not just theoretically know that there is a pattern, but really see it. So here I have like, this is one of the examples from the WWDC presentation about data flow in SwiftUI, I think. So you have here some star ratings and another button where you can clear it and set it back to one rating, one star rating. This is the very simple implementation of these two views together. And this is one of them, the sub view of this one. And you see, I have here some red underlines. I do have some boxes I have here a couple of arrows going on. It's for me 
because things are moving so much in my head, I need to fix it. And if you put it on paper, it's fixed. It's come kind of, I can hold on to it. I have it in my hands kind of feeling. And I also can put this here and put this there so it doesn't move anymore. And then maybe I have some, draw some arrows somewhere. You will see more of these later. So the idea between writing this down can be, I have some notes that are just, that are just really brain dumps. Where I just, it's really more a vomiting out whatever I have in my head because it's too much to keep at the same time. There is the um, Thinkarium, I don't remember, where Dumbledore puts out his thoughts into a bowl so he can examine them one by one. This is the same idea when I write things down. Just want to, at one point, have a list of everything and then I can concentrate and pick one by one to not overwhelm, be overwhelmed anymore and have really take my time because sometimes I'm just impatient and too fast. So this is one one kind of note where I just any paper I can just write down everything and then afterwards if I'm too confused to write down my whole summary. If you have ever there is the sheet sheet effect which means that if you ever in school wrote a sheet sheet you will know that it's only supposed to be really small so you have to think really think of what kind of what you want to you trying to make the most of the space and really boil things to the bare minimum of what you need, what is more useful in different situations, like a formula, maybe a name that you would might need, but you are trying to find the ones that make the most of the space you have on your paper. And when you write it down and when you, because you're actually really thinking about it, I mean, some people think they think about it, but they're actually just passively listening like a brain zombie. This is not something that comes easily. You have to put in the work. You have to think about it. And when you write a cheat sheet, you that's what you do. You super engage with it. So most of the time, if you once wrote, you, that's the important thing. You have to write a cheat sheet yourself. It doesn't work if you copy somebody else's cheat sheet because it's not the having the cheat sheet that makes, that's the trick. It's writing it and thinking about it and creating it. Because when you think about what's the most useful information, that's the moment where you compare things, you move things in your mind, and you really think about it. So, which is also why most of the time, if you really, especially the good cheat sheets, you don't need doing the test anymore. So just by writing it, you already learn so much more. The other um, view you could have in order to write this is to write a cookbook for your future self or maybe somebody who doesn't know a lot about it so you're trying to really break it down to the main steps of how do you do this and this in five steps and really explain it to the to the um, most essential things that make a huge difference then at this point Ma, it's already a lot clearer one of the misconceptions that we sometimes i think it's quite common for most people is the misconception that you think no, you either know it or you don't know it or you have a talent for this or you don't have a talent you you have it what it takes or you don't have it this is not it's not a either or it's not black or white it's you, there's a lot of gray zones you can in order to reach a really deep understanding you need to keep on working on the same topic come back to it later maybe after you have a sudden jump after half a year or a year so in order for me to extend the time I'm thinking of about a topic, I do after maybe in the evening, after a couple of hours or maybe a day later or two, but don't go longer than two days because then you lose the direct contact to it. Mm. So you have kind of a sleeping mode of your brain cells. So your neurons can be either active or passive. If they're passive, it's really hard to, it's very slow thinking of oh, how did it go? How was that? And then in order to get them into active state where everything is like, it's there. In order to switch to active state, you need to engage a lot more again. And your active parts will, back, will fall back into passive state after the average is about two days for most people. This is the long weekend or the weekend symptom of most people. On Friday, you really, you know what you're doing during the whole week. And then on Monday morning, it's like, this is like, what did I do? What am I supposed to do? What's going on? This is the, you're again falling back into sleep mode. 
or the part that you want to access in your brain falls back into sleep mode. It really depends on people. For me, I usually feel it's like after a long weekend, so after three days. <laughs> but that's why I'm saying you shouldn't wait too long to uh, reiterate, repeat what you just learned. So this is uh, this is, doesn't need to be long. Usually it's like 10, 20 minutes. It's really not a big deal. But in between um, your first notes and then rethinking about it, coming back to it, your time, your neurons, your mind did have some time to consolidate. So even if you don't actively think about it, it's still working on it because they are active neurons. So it's not like a computer, which is either you have it in, it's not the same as active and passive memory. The amazing um, benefit of having active and passive knowledge is that if everything in your brain would be the same price, it's like a priority. You have so much stuff that could come up when you think about it. If you have a problem, your brain will look for the stuff that was previously important. Since what you recently thought about is still active, the neurons are still active, they are easier to excite and, and start a new thought. So that's why you have, it helps your, your thought process to think about the stuff that was recently important, because this is probably very likely the stuff that you right now need. So it's not about you either know it or not know it. It's how much was I recently engaging with this? How much did I previously knew about it? How much do I actually know about it too? So after one or two days, I do need to consolidate again or just re repeat it. And maybe I'll just show you the same note again. What I do in the first step is I just write down everything. And in the second step, I'm drawing these boxes around things. This is more of for me to block things into smaller parts because it's usually easier to think on one task at a time. So I know that this belongs together, this belongs together, this belongs together. Instead of having just a blur of 100 lines of code where it's too much to occupy at once, to think about at once. Then I put some highlights with colors around things that I've at this moment, because this can change. What I think in this moment is the most important, what relates. And this is also, I put in here some extra comments. I put in some arrows of where things can go. So it's more being engaged with it. The other thing is, since in the process, I'm trying to explain it to myself again of well, how did it work? So you don't need to talk about it loudly. It's just thinking through because this is the moment when you realize maybe you have a gap somewhere. Maybe you have a really good understanding of a certain part. Maybe you realize there is a mistake in things because actually here there is. Um, I mean, you don't, you really don't need to find it. It is, I have here a little uh, loop of endlessly updating my rating. But at this point, because I just started with it, when I tried to figure out how to use this uh, UI view representable, I was just trying to figure out different ways of passing data around. So on a very basic level, I tried to, to make it work. So this was the first encounter with this. And at that point, I was so occupied with understanding where things are going and just implementing this protocol that I was not, that I didn't have space in my mind, in my working memory, to also go into more details and see this error at this point. I don't mind because I did learn from it. And every time I learn from my own mistakes, I'm very proud of it because it means I have a, as long as I am able to solve it, it means I have learned something. And I have, sometimes it's also this feeling of, oh, this is what I talked about. Now I understand it's not the theoretic knowledge of, yeah, this is, they say this is in this and this. It's like, ah, that's what they were talking about. Sometimes you have to create your the, the, this problem by yourself in order to feel it. And I need to repeat this process depending on how much mm, problems I had in the beginning. And also if I start. It does feel, if it's a totally new topic, I might need to come back and later and repeat and master it. So for example, I did write, I started having one notebook for Swift UI and it was so messy that I decided in the end, because they changed so much, that I had to write, rewrite my notes. So I started a new notebook and rewrote everything. So you will see also the example again, but it's really important to know that you need to repeat these steps 
you also should start to consider to think about how well do I know the topic from zero to ten, how certain I am of it. Am I only at a one of kind of I I have an idea why this is useful to nine of I can very easily repeat recreate the examples that I had before I can okay maybe that's the five and if you're a nine or a ten it means you can very much take it apart and see the connections to other puzzles. The idea behind these note-taking parts is that I very I improve my thinking by writing. I had during my first semester a in the math um, one of the math classes the professor was insisting that we were writing handwriting the notes because he said the information flow goes from the blackboard through your eyes and your brain then you need to write it down so it goes through your arm and you write it down and you, you see your own handwriting again so it goes again to your through your brain so you have this multiple loops of information coming inside of your brain or pros being processed in different parts of your brain multiple times which helps to make it stick to in be more active with what you see what you want to learn then this um, fact when i said try to explain the code to yourself is there is actually um, a technique it's apparently one technique from the romans so from seneca the younger i think it's the docendo discimus I read Latin in school. Nobody would have thought that that come in handy, but now it is. So it means that you can learn by teaching. So docendo is by teaching, and this this chemus means we learn. Most people don't know it under this term. It's more known under the Feynman technique, which probably I should be more excited about because it's a, a physicist who this is named after because he did explain everything so well doing his lectures in a very easy to understand way because he was able to explain very complex problems in an easy to understand digest way but since i am more a um, first come first deserve the honor person I prefer to use the, the to kendo decimus when i say it by teaching i don't mean you need to have somebody you talk to directly Although it seems to be the, what people do. You mean you can be in your own room talking aloud like me. It's like it's not really weird. You can just you don't need to talk aloud. But although it does help. You can think it through. That is also explaining it because it's the main thing. It's not having somebody who takes it. It's explaining it and trying to explain it in different ways multiple times. Because this is the moment when you really have to think about it. You cannot take shortcuts if you explain why things are the way they are. I, you can either talk aloud or that's when I say you write a cookbook because you need to explain these main steps to get to from A to B or the cheat sheet effect, extracting the core principles of what you need. Most people, when they use tutorials or when they want to learn something, they stop by just watching a tutorial. Maybe they repeat, they tell themselves, I engage because I copied all the lines. Edge is really bad because sometimes I realize when I, I just copy paste, especially on Ray Wenderlich, because they actually this is the worst. They say, please copy this into your this and this in your code base. You don't even type it. And sometimes, quite a few times, when I, I did copy it, let's face it, I did copy it, and I had to, I was handwriting it into my notes. I realized because I was, I had to really write all the full words, I realized. I didn't know that was there. That sounds interesting. What is this? <laughs> so only follow passively these tutorials. You don't really engage and get these insights. Unfortunately, this is where, where most people stop. I was really wondering why, but I guess it's because you people are used to, because you're used to schools where you're supposed to be, you're not allowed to write your own thoughts. You're not allowed to ask your own thoughts or talk, share your own thoughts. Not having questions, I mean real questions. So you're trained in a way of passive learning, which is only this first step, and then you stop. Because why do you need to be actually smart? Why would you be want to be smart and just continue investigating further? For me, this is just the start, and maybe only 10% 10, 10 of the time I'm actually watching this tutorial, and then the rest I need to play and search 
customize, write my notes, think about it. So this is really for me where the main thing happens. So I <laughs> invest more time on one topic and I go deeper. There are some studies about geniuses and it's usually about what does it take to get to this level. One of the things that is common is that high achievers or masters, geniuses, they do a lot of work. That's why you see this XYZ is reading 50 books per week. You see they do and they put in the work. But it's not about just putting in the work. It's about being smart of what you do with your, with your time. There's a quote from Thomas Edison, which is genius is, is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you complain that you didn't reach master level yet, I can ask you how much did you spend? Did you spend as much as me reading all this, making all these notes and putting in the work? It's the same when doing my PhD. For me, people who made it to the end to have a physics PhD, the ones that made it to the end, what I was admiring is the amount of work they put in. It's not being a genius, being extremely smart, having it. It's pushing through, suffering a lot of tears, being in this red race for four years. It's the work you do that makes a difference. You can have some talent, of course it helps, but it's not going to it's not going to make the difference in the end. What makes you go through the end is how much you you push through. Which although I'm trying to help you and not suffering too much. And spending your time wisely. <laughs> One more reason what I like about taking notes, especially now when I can show you, look how much work I actually put into. I can physically show you how much work I put into or just give you a feeling, an idea of how much work I put into this. Because sometimes, especially if you learn, you don't know how much it's taking so much time. You have no, you don't know how long it takes and it can be very frustrating at times when you don't feel you did anything. You don't have a progress. That's the other advantage of having some notes is that you know this is kind of a progress report. You see how many books you filled. It doesn't mean you are like, I'm not saying this is the absolute way of seeing your progress. It's just giving you one more motivation, an idea of what you actually learned. It's a constant improvement. I like the Japanese way of Kaizen, which is small improvements every day. Because this is much more motivating than an unrealistic goal of you learn programming in three months. <sighs> Sometimes. What an illusion. The other nice thing, you can also use this kind of notes in order to know what kind of stacks you already worked with. So if you write your resume, you can say, okay, I worked with this and this stack. I know you also already more comfortable and giving yourself feedback on your knowledge base or sure you are of a certain topic and you can also summarize this nicely if you want to write a resume. In the second part I want to show you some of my notes. It might be a little bit difficult from the resolution. You can find a link with all of these scans so you can take your time and investigate how I do things. I'm not trying to show you the perfect notes. I'm just trying to show you how I use note in order to get smarter. To improve my skill. If you would write them differently, that's absolutely amazing because it means you already have some connections because you will see the difference and you should keep to your style or your understanding. But you can obviously be interested in my different point of view because this is just the one point of view, the one snapshot of how I did approach this topic at this time. If I look at them now, this is like for me a memory walk. Sometimes it's like, mm, I did I do that at this point? For example, here, this is my first notebook when I started Swift. I have here a failable initializer and I was like, I did that in the very beginning? Because obviously this was way too much for me. A simple init would have been already like, okay. <laughs> Sometimes you, are, you start learning something which you don't see the use at that point. And then you come back later and you, it finally fits in because you have other things you can connect it to. So you see here, I have some boxes, some drawings. This is from the documentation. No shame in copying things that are quite useful. Then we come into more difficult topics, or at least it was more difficult for me at this time, So which is protocols. 
So I have here more explanations, more examples. So this is different protocols of examples. <laughs> then there's the codable protocol. I put the codable protocol under protocols and I do have another reference to it when I was learning archiving. So how to save data on a disk, how to send network requests. But this is totally okay. You can have one topic in different contexts because obviously codable is so useful. You will use it in different ones. But I needed to at this point understand what actually a protocol is. Then creating a protocol. One of the example use cases for protocols is how to use them with delegation. And you see here the implementation, an example with some dice game, which is probably really not the best example because this is not at all how I use it now. But you see here, there's some errors. It's not really that it's because a lot of things go all over the place. So what do I implement here? What do I call on this part? And it's actually interesting because I remember that when I did this, I was like, this is really complicated. Why am I doing this? And maybe that's why I don't like, I don't need to use delegates because I use closures for this, but this was important. Maybe I didn't get it at this point fully. That's totally fine. Then I have here um, protocol oriented programming with some smaller examples of, or oh, this is how you compose protocols. You can have one class and then multiple protocols. I do like to use a lot of errors because it means that I'm like, oh yeah, this is going there. It also encourages me to see the flow of all these code snippets because obviously I put them together for some reason. What are they doing together? This is another um, notebook. Here, this is the first page, which is the table of contents. So I do try to keep them in the same category. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes I have multiple things at the different ones. But the main point is that this is the, what I consider similar things, but I would want to, sometimes you just need to have a hint of where to go, which tool you need. So for example, here's something with animations, see a layer, core animation or pencil case, the different way of drawing. This is the part that I was looking at core animations. You see here a timing curve because there's time and progress. So it's more, um, it doesn't need to be pretty. It's just the, I do understand what I'm doing there. Sometimes it's here. I did a, um, a interruptible animation with UI kit or core animations. And you see, it's actually a state of animation. If you want to have a interruptible animation in UI kit, you need to define some kind of state machine because you need to know what's the state, what do I need to animate? Do I need to, if I stop my, if it's interruptible, if I stop my animation in the middle, where am I going? Do am I going from beginning to end or from the end to the beginning? So you need to decide how to define your states and what to do when a certain state is going to be changed. I have here an example of a animation in UI kit, which is interruptible. So basically you can slide open. This is the amazing drawing. You can slide open this part by pen with a pen gesture and it's interruptible. This means that you can slide it open a little bit and then close it again. So it would automatically also move down again if you decide how far to stop it. And you see here, I have to define a state machine. <laughs> Because this is how you do it in Swift in UI kit. And here on the right, you see the implementation. So this is the beginning of this setting up the animation. And then on the next page, this is the pen gesture. There's two functions here in this gesture. I have to decide if I have to update the animation or if I have to reverse the direction. So it is three pages of code. I mean, obviously you, you say, yeah, if you know you are Swift UI, you know, this is so much easier with Swift UI, but appreciating how much easier it is with Swift UI, you only get, I mean, the real appreciation is only if you ever went through one of these implementing this by yourself, the whole state machine. The additional benefits is that I had to hear myself define a state machine. If you know that, if I, since I know that. And I understand that Swift UI is state driven. It's declarative. I have a state property on the beginning. The reason why animations are so much easier in Swift UI is because the views are state driven by, by themselves. So you have already implemented from the very beginning, a state machine, which means that 
since because I did all this work in the beginning, which might seem a little bit unnecessary, I now understand SwiftUI better. This is a very important page about core animations. And you see here the how this frameworks work together. So we have AppKit, Core Animation, Metal, Core Graphics, and Graphics Hardware. So you might not know, but the UI view is just the layer on top of CI layer where we have additionally the user interaction. All the drawing and the animation is done by CA layer. And actually core animation CA layer includes also the lower part with core, core graphics. So you can have, that's why you see CG rect for core graphics for all the drawing parts. But the layer, the CA part is the additional animation to the drawing part. So once I know where this comes in to the other parts, so I know now I have some, this is the small example, some layer part where I can change here the size. I can now also add, because I have a CA core animation layer, I can now here add a basic animation. So this is a very short example of this CA layer together in the context of the view controller. On the right side is just a summary of all the different components. So this is really a summary of what the hell is all of this doing with each other. So I have these different layers. I can have a basic layer. I can have a shape layer to draw, a text layer, a gradient layer, application layer. I can have here the animation part, which is basic animation, keyframe animation, CA transitions, CA animation groups. Once I know where to look when I want to draw CA the layer, I can also now look at how do I add here keyframe animation. And the reason why these are red is because I added them some more details about them in the next pages. So here is the CA layer with all the properties and also the ones that are animatable. So you can animate the layers, opacity, if it's hidden, the corner radius, the shadow. This is probably the one that most people interact with layers because you have to add the, layer, the shadow to the view's layer and not to the view itself. This is again the um, example I started already with the um, Swift UI because this is so I, in the beginning, it was like everything is, especially in the beginning, in the better versions, there was so much information out there. Well, there was not so much information out there. And what was out there did change quite a lot. You can also see this in my notes. So this is the page you saw before with the subclassing of UI views. This is another page where I was trying to figure out the data management in Swift UI. So you see here some small images of where, how do I display on the top view? How do I give it to my ch children views? What's the difference between the state and the observable object? Or as it here previously was, bindable object. So there's some... It's just a rough way of sketching how I see where things are going. Even more representable of the beginning of SwiftUI is this page. Because this is how this observable object works. So this is the very beginning. You see here, I have like, I had to erase this. This was, I don't remember what it was. The subject, you see, you had to define the subject yourself. Changing from object will change to, from did change to will change to object will change. You see this all here, some crossing out here and here again. And then the final one where they said, okay, it has to be no observable object. And you don't need to implement this pass through subject. Object will change by yourself anymore. And then here's some, it's more a recipes of how do you inject, how do you use initializers with this at state properties at binding. So it's super messy, which is totally fine considering how I started, how this started. Since I already knew a little bit better when I wrote, rewrote this, my notes also show, they look a lot clearer because it was more clear represented in my mind. So this is the star rating where I still have like five different implementation of this with, because I was trying to figure out if it's a delegate data source, a target action pattern, notification center, which one of this is working the best. And then here you see, this is the, when I said there's a mistake in my notes, in my example, I did find it eventually. And this is also why I didn't have a problem because I, I found it, I fixed it. I don't have a problem with this. So I highlight that I have here now a working solution because I don't have a loop anymore between my two views passing data back and forth, which means my UI kit views, my UI kit code and my Swift UI code. You see here, I again have some where things are going. 
and these two are binded together. This one is passed down in this function and then comes up in another function or in one of these. That's how I need these. That's why I need these. And where I would prefer which implementation, this is also what I have here. It's like, uh, this I try to use for this and this. It fits very well with this and this. I do have a very popular tutorial about MVVN and SwiftUI. They have this kind of drawings inside and they don't come from nowhere. I did rework and rethink this topic for quite a while. Since this is how I started considering and understanding it, it was obvious that I would take these images in a more structured, more pretty way into the YouTube tutorial. But it definitely, it, it took a lot of time. It means that because I put so much work, I could condense everything down very small. So this is the, it's probably the smallest thing I now need in order to see the data flow, data management in SwiftUI. Of having here a um, view model where hey, I have here some data on the root for different views, different sub views, to passing it back and forth with this get, in which you see here from get and set. What kind of, if it, do I have a simple data? Or is it more complex? Which one do I use? So it's really condensed down because at that level I did get it. But I'm going through quite a few iterations and especially if I, it's, it's a bit more complicated in the beginning or I'm not even able to write a one page structured. Sometimes I really, it's more vomiting out. For example, because I cannot only show pretty notes, I also want to show notes that are for thinking. I have a different you can have an extra paper or I have an extra notebook where I just scribble. So this is the notes I did for design patterns and communication patterns. But it's just like, okay, what is, what kind of, what do I want to accomplish? I want to have a highly modularized code. What kind of patterns do I have? What are the benefits? I was just reading through some papers and collecting stuff. So it's more a list of all the things I had and the, all the things I thought about it. And then afterwards I was like, oh, look, I was just highlighting things that in this moment I thought was the most interesting. So here, for example, I have a um, property observer did that with a heart because I know that lots of, this is very common and people like to use the sets. It's also very easy to implement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is the next page where it's just like, I have this and this and this and this and here, I, oh, okay, I have this many views, which I could go there, which I could go there. What do I actually want to show? How many sub views do I have? Where is things going? So it's like, it's more, it's really the part of writing it down helps me to think. And since I know this is just a temporary note, it's not a permanent one. It's totally, it's totally, this is exactly what I'm using this for, to, um, to understand the whole shizzle better. And this is the um, most messy note I have. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is usually not what people try to show in a tutorial about note taking. People really don't try to show the most messy. It's mostly making it more beautiful, pretty. This is really not the point I'm using notes for. So why would I pretend that oh, everything is pretty? So this is the notes I did for this tutorial because I wasn't sure what I should talk about. If it's worth it. So you see here my one, two, three, four steps that I explained of tutorials, tutorials, what's better, writing notes on paper and coming back. So I started by really just writing a list of all the things I know. This um, letters here, this ABC is just a tool to not write too long, to really focus on the keywords, on the buzzwords and not write whole sentences. And because this is supposed to be just for me right now to have all the different parts that I might want to use. And I, it's just a collection of all the things that might be interesting for this topic. Sometimes you have, I have here the moving parts, drawing and go from here to here to here, which looks really all over the place. But because of just writing everything down in the beginning, because sometimes you just don't know where to start, just write a list of all the things that belongs to this topic. Or you write a list of, you, you read about it in a blog post or a YouTube channel, a YouTube tutorial. Just write the most important parts down or the essential things that you think are important. Sometimes there's just not a lot of information in there, but that's okay. You just keep on going to a new one. You collect your own files and the information you have from the other places. And this is the step where order is not important. It's just collection. 
once you have that, you can like, okay, this belongs together. You can group them, categorize them. And then from there on, your thoughts start to evolve. And this is also why I afterwards realized I have actually these steps and I know now why I'm doing it. Writing this list was a kickoff to gain momentum of thinking about it. And since this is the first step, the first draft, and this is the second, or I don't know, the third or fourth draft of the same topic, what I want to talk about. It's like, where are things going? What are impo what's the important thing that I want to talk about? So it's really, you can just scribble away in the beginning if you are not sure if you have, if it's very unclear what, what, you, what the topic is about, how your understanding of the topic is. It's, but this is okay, it's the evolution, a process of constant improvement, of improving your understanding of the topic, seeing a bigger picture. The goal is to get a deeper understanding, just reiterate about the same topic, seeing the bigger t picture, seeing more connections. Because when I went through, I was like, oh, this is, this is the topic I put there, and this I put there. This is interesting, I didn't realize there was a connection before. But connections mean that you have a knowledge base in one area, and if you have a connection to a different one, you can reuse this knowledge in a different context. The connections is actually what makes your knowledge so much more powerful. Because if you just learn a one process from A to Z, you are only able to follow through the steps one by one. If you understand connections, you can take different parts and put them together in a new context, in a new order, for a new use case. So it's really the power of connections, which also makes your learning exponential. Because once you have 10 tools and you add one more tool, if you have these connections, you can this new tool, you can connect to all of these 10 tools. So you have 10 more, you learn one tool at this step and you have 10 more possibilities. It's super amazing to reach the, the this level of expertise when you see connections, when you can take advantage of your creative mind. This has taken a little bit longer than I wanted to. And I took you on a small how I learned iOS development journey. I really hope that you are more motivated in going deeper and becoming smarter and that you're not frustrated anymore of why am I still on the tutorial? Why am I still in the tutorial trap? The metaphor that I have for tutorial health, you have a, an ocean that you want to fill with knowledge and you basically, every time you start a new tutorial, you have a little bit, but you don't know where it fits in. And you just add another piece of knowledge that you don't know how to use. You don't know where to put it. And you just keep adding on adding. So all of these plastic bottles in this island, plastic island is one of your started projects, topics that you didn't take the time to engage enough with. All of these just floats around and you just keep on dumping stuff in. This is the same effect that you, people do when they want to learn things by heart with flashcards. Don't like them. It's just learning things by heart without meaning, without knowing what the heck should you do with this. This is what you do to yourself, to your own mind, if you don't go deeper. Do you want this? It's your choice. The good thing is your mind has a cleaning program for meaningless, useless, garbage quiz knowledge. And that's called forgetting. It's not, forgetting is not a bad thing. It's an amazing tool because it means your mind is not filled up with stuff that is not useful for you. In order to forget you, actually, your brain needs to put in some effort because it's optimized to use less energy. There must be a huge advantage of forgetting. That's because your knowledge is not supposed to look like this. For me, the best image that fits how I want to shape my knowledge, my skill set, my mind, is this kind of futuristic city. So you have different islands of knowledge. You can build on this knowledge. You just if you want to have this one island, it's very easy to build on top of it. But you might have some gaps in your knowledge where you need to, f you have, you start building smaller islands. But the important thing is that you build, you always, if you see this, you want to have bridges in between. Because otherwise, what's the point of having this small island here if you cannot ever access it? Your mind is a network. It's like, where did I put this? Oh yeah, I went here, then I went there, then it's, ah, it's there. So you can really walk into your knowledge base and look at the tools that might be useful in each case. So this is what you want to have a structured, very beneficial, very organized network of knowledge. But obviously, once you have this kind of base layer to add new knowledge, it's always more fun to add knowledge to something you already know than start from the beginning. When you begin, 
<laughs> it looks more like this, this water park, because each of these ways is more like a tutorial. It's like a um, temporary helping hand where you can go from A to B. It's a bit, it feels clumsy because you need to, you're struggling on the way, but this kind of floating devices, they are really flexible. You can, at this point, when you just started to put in, because you want to decide how you place your path for the other side, how you want to create your islands and your network, these parts are useful in the beginning because they are flexible. You're like, maybe it fits better there. Maybe it fits better there. And then you reorganize your stuff. That's why in the beginning, when you really learn it, it feels clumsy. You're running over slippery paths. But the more you run over this, the more you engage, you think about it, your network or your pathways, your thinking ways, they become very much like beaten paths. The more you use them, the more you gain. Something that looks like this in the beginning, which is very uncomfortable, slightly uncomfortable, won't overdo it, can feel like a super highway, a data highway in your mind of, oh, I know how to do this really easy. Put this here, do this there, do this there. It's super easy at this point. But in order to go to this place, you cannot skip this step. You cannot just take one solution and then pave it and then think this is the best way of doing it. This is not how you become a smart, creative mind. Let me know if you agree with something or if something of this, what I said is actually new because this is quite interesting. I do like to know how other people think, which is, I guess, for a lot of people want to know. There's quite a few videos which are like how I was following the routine of, I don't know, Da Vinci. And people really like to see it, but it's not the routine, not how they lift, it's how they think that is the most interesting. Especially Leonardo da Vinci, because he was a creative genius. I invite you to try my process once. You can also take inspiration from my notes, but feel free to vary as much as you want. Just try it a couple of weeks to get a feeling of a different way of thinking. Because I really believe that the way you think changes how your mind can evolve and grow. Give this video a like if you think that other people should also watch this. Until next time, have fun learning.